journey that I um, undertook with some friends a couple of years ago, and it was a story about scientific innovation and the challenge of commercialising ideas. Um, so I am a scientist, as you would have heard, and this is a beautiful photograph of a honeybee. So one of the commercial possibilities of honeybee olfaction. In this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the journey that we took. Um, trying to take an idea, building a team, finding the right backers, nurturing and developing the idea, and then, of course, the hard work, of selling the idea, trying to make it into reality. And I'm going to have a few conclusions. So, the opportunity that we identified, uh, we had a workshop, and it was talking about um, vapour detection and identification. And we had lots of speakers there. I was there representing the analytical scientists. I'm a mass spectrometrist by training. Very sensitive technique, but you need a big box, like a wardrobe, with lots of power cables and magnets and all sorts of fancy stuff. We had people from agricultural research, and we had other people with electronic noses, and we had a very interesting time, and we all talked about what could we do if we could read the world of smells. And these are some of the applications that we could, we could think of. <coughs> the thing you need before you have the idea, though, is that passion to make a difference, to make a change. To make, to make an impact. So that's what we were trying to do. We had this crazy idea. The team that we put together, uh, this is my colleague, Professor Paul Davis. Um, we, he's, he's chief executive officer and chief scientist, but we actually call him the chief scientific optimist in the organization. He has, um, he's just a serial entrepreneur. He just keeps producing these crazy ideas. And some of them are fantastic, some of them <laughs> don't, don't necessarily work quite so well. Uh, anyway, so the team we put together, we had Paul Davis, we had two other scientists, a beekeeper, we had our partners in the organisation we managed to drag in, uh, we had some financial backers, because we, a lot of us started from Unilever Research, and we had 50,000 willing helpers. We had a hive or two of honeybees. Now, in the popular press, you quite often see things where people's spaniels start, <laughs> start pawing at their leg. And the guys basically go to the doctor and they find that they've got skin cancer. So the possibilities of actually using, and presumably the dog is actually detecting some change in the body, and is actually trying to tell the owner that they've got something wrong with them. Now, the, there's the, the favourite of the Daily Mail, well, every week probably, has an interesting thing about... Uh, <laughs> mad things happening, but doctors trained dogs to sniff out a very cancer in August 2013. Um, this has actually percolated into the scientific literature as well. Uh, this is a paper from 2006, Diagnostic Accuracy of Canine Scent Detection in Early and Late Stage Lung and Breast Cancers. This was a really carefully controlled study and they demonstrated that you can use dogs to detect patients with cancer. So you can do it. So, but our leap of faith was, well, if dogs can do it, and they're, they're, they're obviously fantastic sense of stuff, what about insects? Insects have a lot of potential advantages. This is, a, this is an electron micrograph of an antenna, an antenna from a honeybee. This is a close-up. These pits are the olfactory organs of the honeybee arrayed on this antenna. We speculated that we could probably, because we're protein biochemists, we could take these proteins, we could build them into chips, and we could make an electronic nose. And then we thought, how much is it going to cost to do all that engineering, to design the systems, to integrate them? And then we thought, but why would you do that? Nature's already done it. If you, if you think about it, a hive is a mass production facility. It's churning out honeybees at the rates of at the peak of the summer, hundreds or thousands a day. So we, we thought, well, let's, let's get nature to do all the work. Why would you use an insect? What are the advantages of insects? If you look down this list, you get this fantastic sensitivity. They are self-replicating, robust design, automatic integrated signal interpretation. I'll explain that a bit later. Simple, clear-cut readout. They can train a honeybee in minutes or hours. 
Whereas a dog, to train a dog to actually sniff uh, when you go to the airport, a dog that you meet in the airport, it's taken anywhere between 6 and 12 months to train the dog, and you have to have the trained handler that works with the dog, go with it, so you don't need any of the bees, you can just say goodbye to the bee, they're, they're fine. Uh, they don't get distracted or, or bored, unlike dogs. You can check the response at any time, and no expensive kennels and that us. So we thought, well, it's a great idea. But what we were using is known as the proboscis extension reflex. And this beautiful photograph, this is the little honeybee. There she is. They're all workers, so they're all female. And um, what we do when we try to train them, this is the glass tube. And down the tube, we flow a, a dilute concentration of the odorant that we're interested in. It could be um, explosive related, drug related, it could be a cancer biomarker. You flow the, the gas, the antennae detect the gas, and then <coughs> you reward the bee with a little dab of honey on the cotton bud. And you do that two or three times, and the next time it detects the smell, it thinks to itself, where's my honey? And it sticks out its tongue. So it's basically Pavlovian conditioning on an insect scale. So this is the proboscis extension reflex. It was such an easy and simple thing that we thought, well, this could be how we design the system to do the odor of detection. So here we are. There's our army of uh, little happy sensor units. This is one of our early prototype designs. Um, I must stress, of course, the bees are not harmed in the making of the film. The, the bees are actually quite happy. They're used to working in small spaces. And we used to say that um, we're actually giving them a bit of a holiday because in the summer, the honeybee basically has a life expectancy of about six weeks. They fly themselves to death collecting the pollen and the nectar. So they were having a little rest. Um, these are the, the systems that we developed to harness the, the bees. And the, as you can see, this is where the, the, the odorant comes in and the bees will be placed into these little holders. Gas comes in. As soon as they smell the, the uh, odorant of interest, they stick out their tongue, where's the sugar? We then had to think how we would turn the proboscis extension reflex into an output, into a red light flashing on top of the machine. And so this is a bit of systems engineering where we have, if you can see the little green crosses, the software recognises the shape of the bee's head, and when it sticks out of the proboscis, the, the extension of that, that shape extends, the software plots the distance between the two crosses, and in these two channels, you'll see that there's a, a response, and in the control channel, there's no response. So, so that was the way we would take the bees, put them into a system, use the system to interpret and integrate the, the response from the bees, and we detected it. Then we had to think how we would make the idea work. Um, mass producing the bees is not a problem, you then had to train the bees, condition them, put them into the sensor units. Now, our business model that we developed, uh, because bees are so easily mass produced, you just need 10 hives and you've got half a million worker bees ready to go. So it, it makes sense. Um, we were developing automated bee collection, uh, conditioning, quality control, cassette loading and distribution. The bee cassette would be functional for at least a week. The bees could survive in the, in the holders for up to 10 days, so, and possibly two weeks. Um, you use them for that week and then return on a weekly basis to the production facility for reloading. So it was, it was uh, potentially, yeah, it's, a, it, it's a workable solution. The potential markets we identified, and I alluded them to, a, to them earlier in, the, um, in, the, in the, the schematic, medical diagnostic is that, that's, that if you can do that, that would be fantastic. Um, military and security applications, uh, the IEDs, which is the language in, in the Iraq war, in, improvised explosive devices, other threat detection, contraband, anywhere where things are emitting odors that are telltale symbols, uh, those, those would be op op opportunities for this technology. Food quality, consumer product authenticity, pests, damp rot. Um, we were able to win several research grants. Uh, basically, uh, the military was turned out to be far more open-minded than most of the commercial companies that we were dealing with. 
uh, the American military spent an unfeasibly large amount of money on, on new technologies. Absolutely fantastic. And I, I, was, I had the honor of attending one of these conferences. And the stuff that they were doing is absolutely fantastic. Um, this, was, this was a very, uh, the Americans loved this technology. And they, they did some very rigorous um, trials with it, as you'll see later. We were working also with the, the Home Office in the UK. Um, we were able to use some of their kit to show that the bee can detect odorants at the level of parts per trillion or below, which is absolutely astonishing. Instantaneous, you let the, the bee smell the thing, 600 times, it can work at parts per trillion level. Now, as an analytical, analytical chemist, I was doing parts per trillion analysis with food extracts and so on to detect poisons and things. But it takes the process, the analytical chemistry of behind that, it would take you about two or three days to do that. But to do it online, instantaneously, it was breathtaking. And all of the scientists we've dealt with have been uh, amazed by it. Um, we're trying to get real. The field test, we went to a, the testing ground, I think it's in the, um, in the sort of wild, wild, uh, southwest of America, there's the deserts there, and they have mock-ups of um, Iraq, and they hide bombs, and our detection technology was found to be the only hand-portal technology able to detect car bombs outdoors. So they were very excited about that. Uh, of course, being bees in a box, we got lots of Daily Mail <laughs> interest. Um, <laughs> We declined Richard and Judy. Uh, I did go, this is me in the Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. Uh, this, is, this is one of our sensor units with uh, half a dozen bees inside it. And this is the competition. Um, and we went over just to, to film for this uh, French television channel, uh, Mona Lisa television. Um, and the funny thing was, we, we set up the, the, the kind of desk here and people started queuing next to it to have their bags checked. And we were actually checking people's bags and they were, they were so happy. It was, <laughs> it, it, it was quite surreal. Um, so, and it, we had lots of interest, um, but it came to the crunch. Um, we spent two years of hard graft developing it, exploring the science, um, trying to get commercial relationships. And this summarizes it. Two years, uh, we had to we had to acknowledge it. The positives: the science is fantastic. We enjoyed the science enormously. Uh, it's a unique detection solution, rapid, sensitive, flexible, and potentially economical. We still believe in that. The negatives: trying to sell uh, bees in a box as into a <laughs> a really controlled environment like uh, uh, security in an airport. Uh, it, they just couldn't get it at all. I mean, we showed them it was far better than they were using at the moment. They just wouldn't see it. Uh, we, we had long, protracted discussions, lots of demonstrations, trials and stuff. Just couldn't persuade them. Um, in order to make it economical, you also need to have a fairly... I mean, it's scalable, but you need to have take-up. Um, you need to have, get some large-scale adoption to make, make it work. Uh, Failure is a biological existence. Well, we did actually have indoor hives. We could actually get the bees producing throughout the year. In, in the wild, of course, they rest in the winter. Now, we, we, we felt there, were, there would be easy ways around that. Uh, basically, the idea was too crazy. So at that stage, we, we, um, we, split, the, we split the team. Half, well, two thirds of the team went into a new company that we founded, and we, we ended up developing a a, a new wound care, advanced wound care company, um, not unrelated to the bees. It turns out that we, we developed this enzyme-activated hydrogel wound dressing, which is a bit like honey, surprisingly. It, maybe there was, it percolated through. But the smaller BL factory team, it, it did actually continue trading for 10 years, basically on research grant, grants, um, but I'm sorry to say it did actually fold earlier in, this, uh, in the autumn, um, the cash flow problems. So, in order to summarise our learnings, you've got to have, the first thing is passion. You have to be prepared to put in the work. 
These three leadership cliches, I think, summarize everything. The best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. So, first of all, be creative. Uh, as Louis Pasteur said, chance favours the prepared mind is the way we anglo saxons say it. The French have a rather more beautiful way of saying it, um, which I'm not going to try and repeat. Um, and then finally, genius, 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. It's a long haul. If you're in, in for success, you've got to put in the work. So, thank you very much.